Okay, good morning, Forward Point. How are we all doing today? All right, we'll do that one more time. Good morning, everyone. How are we doing today? Hey, all right, we are alive. Come on. So much to be thankful for. We are in April, aren't we? Yes, okay. Uh, maybe a little bit of feedback going on up here. Thank you, Jeremy. Sounds a little echo here. It's great to be heard. Hey, uh, so again, with April comes a lot of great things that signifies in my life I always enjoy. And again, the fact that the grass starts growing. Anyone got any uh, buds going on the lilac shad? Any little, what is it, crocuses? My wife said she saw they are coming up to the ground. Anyone got a little bit of stuff coming you can see? And usually it signifies that snow will be gone within the next 60 days. No, I'm joking, no. Uh, hopefully not. Hopefully it has passed us. But again, being that uh, you know, we have this plow business, April 1st, and it's no April Fool's joke, April 1st is the end of our season, and yet you know, we do have mercy on some clients if we do get a little storm afterwards. But I'll tell you, there's nothing like waking up I'll take every April Fool's joke. I am done getting up at 2, 3 in the morning for the last five months previous, and uh, I enjoy it. But I say all that with the fact that April usually, not always, but usually signifies the time of, in the year that we celebrate the life, the death, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And I'll tell you, I love here at Fort Point, I love the series we do throughout the year. I mean, again, we have, you know, in February, we do the, the love series. We just got done doing the Samson series, for, especially for men, to be men of God. But there is really nothing that compares. As I study and as I meditate and as I just love teaching, sharing, preaching, whatever you want to call it, but being with you all, talking about the life and love of Jesus. There is nothing that compares. So with that said, Jimmy already mentioned, and as you saw on our screen here, we are going to be doing a three-week series on the love like Jesus. Love like Jesus that compares to nothing, and it's not love as we all know it, the, what the world teaches. So we are going to have uh, topics such as how he washed his disciples' feet and how Jesus forgave sins. But today, we are going to talk about how we're going to love like Jesus and how he broke bread. Uh, if you were here last week with us, we have our family gathering in which we eat together afterwards, and it's always an awesome time. But from there, uh, we, uh, we have a time of communion, and it signifies how Jesus, at this Last Supper, broke bread with his disciples. So real quick, I'm going to throw out a question to you. Most of us, we've heard the question posed before, why did Jesus come? If you haven't thought about it, again, I'll just throw it out there. Why did Jesus come? All right? Here's some different things that uh, he did come. He came to give us life and more abundant. He came not for the righteous, but for sinners who to repent. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came as a ransom for many. He came not to be served, but to serve, okay? So why did Jesus come? All of those reasons. I'm going to throw out a question that we rarely maybe have ever asked ourselves, or maybe no one has ever asked you. Not why did Jesus come, but how did Jesus come? Not why. Why gives you the motive, it gives you the heart, it's beautiful. But we really ask ourselves, how did he come? You could say, well, he came preaching, he came teaching, he came healing, and he was caring. All are correct. Absolutely. He did come like that. But I'm going to throw something out there today that hopefully will help us understand about loving like Jesus and how he broke bread. And we're going to go real quick to Luke chapter 7, 34. If you have the YouVersion app, you can go right there and follow along with us. And it reads this. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. 
And you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So how did Jesus come? He came eating and drinking. I'll ask us and we can all repeat it. How did Jesus come? He came and drinking. You can now say to yourself, wow, I did not know how much I had in common with Jesus. No, uh, uh, the fact that he came eating and drinking. He did not come as on an island to be worshipped from afar. He came to live among us. In the Gospel of John, it talks about how the Word becomes flesh. He came from heaven to us and made his dwelling, made his living among us. He came eating and drinking, spending community with people where he got to know them, share with them, life with them, pour into them the things of God to know the Father's heart. He came eating and drinking. 20 years ago, most of you know, this was a a great challenge for me because even though I was raised in the church, I did not experience community, especially as I know it now. And most people would say, come on, you know, you're a big community advocate. You love this community. Yes, we live and breathe this community. We are, our heart is different. God had to do something inside my wife and I to say, you know what? Regardless of our situation, we are going to be here. We are going to be involved here. We are going to be among the people. But this has not always been the case. In fact, communities, again, 50, 60 years ago, have changed so drastically over this time. And there's been studies shown, and there's books been written, talking about how tough it is to literally have community, talking about the breaking of bread, talking about living amongst one another. Part of these things that happened over the last 50 to 70 years, here's what's gone on, that has caused, again, a disturbance or caused a breaking to make this much more difficult. We, we take it maybe for granted that we have a window air conditioner, maybe you have a little portable air conditioner, or you have central air, which is always wonderful. A lot of us take it for granted that we have these things. But you've got to understand, years ago, people did not have air conditioning. So what would they do? That's why in these old villages you see all these open porches. Many of them now have all been enclosed. But you used to sit on your open porch, and as people would come in, you'd wave to your neighbors, and you'd talk to your neighbors, Air conditioning removed a lot of that. So all of a sudden, you have enclosed porches now that are all heated and cooled. You don't have to see your neighbors if you don't want to see your neighbors. Another big thing that happened over the past 50 to 70 years is the fact that we went from detached garages to attached garages. Now, again, these are all great uh, you know, inventions and thoughts and concepts. That there's nothing wrong with them. But with that, you can see now especially when you got the garage door opener, you can go literally from your driveway into your house, not being seen, into your air-conditioned or heated home. So from there, we got TV. And from there, now you don't even have to shop. You can even have your groceries brought to you in the comfort of a package in your home. And it even to the proportions of your ingredients. You don't even have to leave your house almost for anything. So I'm not scolding anyone, and I'm not saying this is even wrong, but the fact that community now has changed so drastically that when we hear about Jesus came eating and drinking, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, a friend of someone who did not look like him or act like him, but he lived among them, sharing the good news of God. It makes it much more difficult. I'm going to read a passage from Acts that is going to talk about the early church. And this is about how the church came together after Christ ascended to heaven. And it's the most beautiful passage. And keep this in the context of breaking bread together here. Acts 2, 42 through verse 47, reads this. They, being the early believers, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. 
Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They even sold their property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread, there we go, hear it again, in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I want this message to be a message of encouragement. It is not a message of condemnation or scolding. But if we answer honestly, how many of us does our life look like that? They didn't even have needs because, again, people just took care of one another. They focused. They were a unit committed to one another. I know my life is far from that. It can get better. I know where God's brought me, but you know what? I want to see more God. I'm going to reread, and I want to make sure people know this is not scripture, just so I don't get misquoted somewhere. I'm going to reread it if we had a translation of what maybe the current picture looks like with most Christians. The Christians were devoted to themselves and occasionally got to church when they had time. No one was filled with awe because there were no signs and wonders performed by the believers. Very few of the believers were together, and they had uh, literally nothing in common because they had really no time with each other. If they sold something, they used the money to buy something better for themselves. They ate on the run, kept to themselves, and were too much in a rush to enjoy one another or give praise to God. They claimed to love God, but they really didn't love each other. And they felt very empty and alone. And as a result, most people disliked them and very few people were saved. I know we can laugh and we can joke about it. And again, it's not, you know, you don't want to have to, have to say, ouch. It sounds really extreme and maybe it's a little bit of an exaggeration. But does God have a better way, church? Does he have a better way for you, a better way for myself? Not about being guilt-tripped. But where does he rank? Is he just something to do in a checkbox? Or is he everything? The Son of Man came eating and drinking. You see, this is going to be one of the things, and I've shared about this before, about the contrast of being in this world and yet not being of it and being a Jesus follower. And yet we are called to love one another. We are called to reach the lost. We are called to be neighborly and to recognize anyone can be our neighbor. And yet to be in this world and not of it, there's going to be principles that are going to basically cause a turning and a stirring inside you, and they're going to be in conflict until we understand God's heart. And one of the biggest ones is the fact that we are taught, especially in this country, to be independent. You hear it among men and women. You know, you got to get educated. you got to be able to provide for yourself. you got to be able to do it. you got it in you to be better than this person or that person and to get ahead. And here's the thing. There is nothing necessarily wrong in that when it comes to hard work and discipline and planning. Unless somehow we think that earns us a spot at the table with God. Unless we think that somehow God will love me more. My identity is in this. Because I'm here to tell you, church, that it's not about being independent. Following Christ is actually living a life of dependency, but not necessarily on the things of this world. It's a call to dependency on him. Without Jesus, we have nothing. So in the end, does Christ call us to a personal relationship with him? Yes, but even more so. I'm going to throw something out there. He calls us to a shared relationship with him. When he broke bread, it wasn't just for this person or just for this person. He said, this is my body. It's broken for you. 
every one of you, regardless of your past, regardless of what you've done, regardless where you were born, regardless of your abilities, my body was broken for you. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. I want to share a few principles in the next just few minutes here that we have. And these principles are about how we have the shared relationship and the shared love of Jesus together. Principle one, we share the love of Jesus with other believers at church. We share the love of Jesus with other believers at church. Okay, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 say this, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, we do have to define what church is. Again, we do not want people thinking that church is one hour or an hour and a half on a Sunday morning because even statistics say right now the average Christian is lucky to come to church once a month, and that's actually nationwide, and I think the dominant is probably in the south. So again, the north, we're lucky probably it's once a quarter maybe, but we do not want to define church as coming just to a Sunday morning. It's much more than that. But the Sunday morning gathering, this gathering as we call it, where we come together here and we worship, I'll tell you right now, you cannot reduce God to a podcast. We welcome every guest. We love everyone who jumps on live streaming. But we want that to be the starting point, to say God has something more you will not really get to understand the love of God until you get to understand one another. And you walk with people. You rejoice with those who rejoice. You mourn with those who mourn. We are called to encourage one another. The idea that we can somehow stay in our air-conditioned homes where we can have our Amazon packages come to us and our home chef or whatever, uh, fresh whatever, and our groceries come there and we, we can stay and we don't have to meet people. In fact, we can even get on social media and look like we have real relationships just because we click a post and say we like someone. There's nothing wrong within that unless that's all there is because he's got something so much more. It is a little messier because when you're in relationship with people, you get the good, bad, and ugly. But again, is our life our life or is it his life? Again, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. It's so easy to find things that trump church. We can look at a bad day and not come. We can have a really good day and want to do something outside. We all have a laundry list of things that we want to do. There's a ton of reasons to not come to a corporate gathering. And only one good reason to do it. And that's because he wants us here. He wants us to take part in other people's lives. Share with one another. When we get together, there's something about the presence of God that brings his purpose, that brings his presence, that recharges us. His words are life. So we share the love of Jesus with other believers at church. And number two, we share the love of Jesus with a committed community of people. As we've been talking about just the Sunday morning gathering and, our, uh, and how it means something, we don't want you thinking that life does not go on outside these walls, whether it is a life group during the week to get to know other people. Spending time with people, nothing to do with church. Just, hey, let's get together. Let's eat. A lot of times we like to entertain ourselves, but do we ever think about the thought of being able to say, you know what, there's a need. I saw something or I want to minister. And I'm here to tell you too that I'm so encouraged that there's so many people that are getting together weekly and not just among themselves, but looking for other ways to minister to their community, to their neighbors, it's so encouraging that God wants to do a greater work inside us. 
20 years ago on this journey of God saying, I want you to be here and among the people that I did not want to be among. I had no idea what was going to take place. And I think my word of encouragement would be when you respond to God's call to reach out to others and to love others, don't expect things to change right away. Don't expect if, you're, if, you, if someone's on your heart and you're praying for someone and you're committed to walking with someone through tough times, don't expect it to change overnight. Maybe it won't even change in your lifetime, but that doesn't mean we don't do it. I remember well over 10 years of being committed to this area and saying, you know what? We're going to do things in despite of what things look like right now. I remember even maybe as of six years ago, Katrina and I having a conversation, and she said, Stephen, doesn't it seem like this is well over 10 years, we've been literally just bonding ourselves to this community, and we really don't have any kindred spirits. Is this even worth it? And you really start having this famine go on with inside you, saying, God, you, we have to just obey you if we're going to do this, and if not, I don't know. You wonder if you made the wrong direction. But then all of a sudden, something breaks, and you might meet one kindred friendship. I remember when we sat down and we talked with Jimmy and Chaz about this idea of what a church could look like in the city where we would live among everyone. We, it wouldn't be a church of judgment. It would be a church of relationship, just then throwing information at people, walking with people through things. And what could come about it? And then one relationship after another relationship and another one. And then God started doing other things. And it was like a snowball effect. And yet... It wasn't us, it was just, there was a time waiting. But we were committed. We were committed during the process. Even in our faults, even in when we fell, we were committed, saying, God, help us. We need your strength, not ours. Again, every reason to fold, only one reason to stay. And it's because the Son of Man came eating and drinking. He broke bread. So we commit ourselves to this body of Christ. Not just to those who look like us. I'm going to challenge you, church. Ask God to fill you, to literally be able to realize that everything is his from the beginning. But we commit ourselves to one another. Not to those who just love us. Not to those who just look like us, act like us, live like us. Realizing that any person can be our neighbor. If right now things are lonely and dry and if you're in a spiritual famine, ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. We aren't perfect. When you're together in community and you're committed to one another, there's going to be moments where you're just going to have little tiffs and you're going to have little arguments. It's part of the process. But God is faithful and he is good. And he teaches us how to walk through things. In closing... I was just praying yesterday, and again, I feel like God gave me just a revelation of something, and I'll probably never look at a loaf of bread the same way. But last week, we passed around these little loaves of bread. And it was sort of funny, because, you know, some people would just take a little nibble. I grew up in the church where I think you had a wafer, you know, you had the little wafer thing, and you, you know, whatever, they're all pre-portioned out, you know, you couldn't get too, you know, fat on those things. But anyway, but those little, little wafers, but that wasn't what it was over 2,000 years ago. Whatever bread there was, whether it was unleavened bread or whatever, it was ripped apart. Just like last week, we tore it apart. And some of these loaves at the, <laughs> on the table, whatever was left as we passed them around each table and people ripped from it, they looked a little bit demented when they were done. These loaves sitting on the table looked a little messed up. And I just got this vision about how perfect Jesus was, how perfect he is. And yet, he came from heaven, but then made his dwelling among us. He came eating and drinking. He came to lay his life down for you and I, who did not deserve it, but he gave his life away regardless. And I thought about how messy his body was on that cross. That he had been whipped, he had had a crown of thorns head. 
the scripture even talks about he was unrecognizable. And yet, his body was the bread of life. So on that cross, all of a sudden, this picture I got was not of a perfect loaf, but a torn apart loaf. And I thought about the fact that if I went into a store and I saw a loaf of bread looking like those loaves of bread, I would have thought a bunch of animals had ripped it apart and eaten it or whatever, and I'd be like, "Uh, let me go to the perfect loaf over here. And yet that God brought me back in this revelation. The broken loaf. The people at that time when his body was on the cross did not realize how that was going to save mankind. And as long as we're looking for the perfect loaf of bread versus the broken loaf because the broken loaf has been shared. It has been experienced. It has been tasted. I'm just going to ask you to allow the Holy Spirit, I'm going to have uh, Jason come up here. I'm just going to ask, we're just going to take a few moments here. I'm just going to ask you to allow the Holy Spirit to just literally speak inside you. And wherever you are today, it's not about perfection. It's not about us trying to get everything right. But wherever we are today, he can bring us deeper. Wherever we are today, he can show you more. Who is this Jesus who came to set the captives free? 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this. God made him who had no sin the perfect loaf, the perfect bread to be sin for us, to be broken, to be shared, to be tasted, to be experienced so that in him you, I, we might become righteousness of God. There's a difference, church, when all of a sudden our thoughts of Jesus get off the picture that we've seen, maybe at grandma's house growing up, or maybe we've worn a cross around our neck. It's all symbolism and nothing's wrong with it at all. But that's the loaf that's not been broken. To break the loaf is to experience him, to share in him. To commit ourselves to one another, to commit ourselves to the calling that he's done for us. We don't wrestle against the things of this world. We wrestle against the spiritual things going on inside. Let's not miss him, church. Let's not miss him. So many people miss the presence of God. They miss what he came to do. Because we just want our life to be perfect. Just because we think he's perfect, we don't realize, no, he came and he served. He came and he got dirty. He became sin. He had no sin. And he says in John chapter 13, If I do this, how much more should you do this? He's got a better, better opportunity for his church, a better way. He came eating and drinking, living among us, breaking bread sharing in the life sharing in the love of the Father Father God I just thank you so much I think you are in the business of showing us yourself I pray for every single person here that we would allow the presence of God 
through the Holy Spirit, through the Comforter, through the Equipper to minister to us right now. If you are weary and you are tired, you can get rest. If you're exhausted from trying to figure it all out and be independent from everyone else, he's got a better way. He said, cast your cares upon me because I will care for you. I will take care of you. I came eating and drinking. Came to be a friend of sinners and tax collectors. Translated as people who are apart from God, people who have done wrong. We all fall into that. I came to be sin, even though I did not have sin. So that we can have life. We can be the righteousness of God. Father, I thank you that you chase us down, even in the midst of us pushing you aside. You love us. A deeper relationship begins today. We don't have to leave here and be unchanged. We can be changed. You can transform us. For every person here that does not know you as your personal Savior, I pray they would ask you in your heart. Life everlasting can begin right now. Surrender yourself to him, church. Let him show you and guide you. Teach us to love like Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.